So DeepMind was founded in 2010 and uh, we joined uh, forces with Google in 2014. One way I describe it is um, as an Apollo program effort for AI to bring together the world's best scientists and best engineers and put them in a kind of perfect environment surrounded by all the resources they need to try and make as quick and a rapid progress on uh, the topic of AI as possible. Another thing that we're sort of experimenting on is also a, a kind of new way of organising science. Really trying to create a hybrid organisation that combines the best from the sort of top Silicon Valley startup culture um, with the best from academic institutes. So our mission, step one, fundamentally solve intelligence. And then step two, that you could use that power of that technology to help us as a society solve everything else. I think there's at least four dimensions that it's worth um, thinking about AI in. So the first and probably most important one is the idea of learning systems versus handcrafted heuristic systems. They've been specifically pre-programmed with a particular solution to a problem. Um, second dimension is the idea of generality versus a special casing or specific purpose. So what many systems are is they're handcrafted and they're built for one particular purpose in mind. What we're interested in at DeepMind is um, the idea of generality. One system that out of the box uh, uh, can do a wide range of tasks. The third dimension that we think a lot about at DeepMind is the idea of groundedness versus logic-based. We think that for a true thinking machine to be able to um, think about and achieve um, high-end tasks, they have to experience the world around them through their senses um, and ground the knowledge that they acquire in this sensory motor experience. And opposed to that, a logic-based systems or symbolic systems um, where knowledges and rules are um, input into that database of knowledge and relationships between that knowledge are hand-coded. Um, and the problem with those systems is when they interact with um, the outside world, um, they find it very difficult to map the logical knowledge they have to these real-world messy situations that they find themselves in. And then the fourth dimension uh, we think a lot about is the idea of active learning versus passive observation. So a lot of AI systems that you use every day, like image recognition or voice recognition, they're kind of um, passive observation systems. They get in some data and then they try and classify that data in some sense. What we're interested in instead is um, active agents. So agents that have a goal in mind, that actually direct, have, uh, have actions they undertake and direct their own learning. So what we're interested in building is general purpose learning systems. One of the biggest and obviously most famous sort of watershed moments in AI history was when in the late 90s, IBM's Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov. But actually Deep Blue was an example of one of these narrow AI systems that was special cased and pre-programmed for one particular purpose. And the way Deep Blue worked was um, by a team of very smart programmers working hand in hand with a team of very smart chess grandmasters and trying to distill their knowledge into and codify it into a set of rules and heuristics. But Deep Blue, although it was incredible at chess, um, it was not able to do anything else. So we wanted to go sort of beyond uh, this kind of narrow AI and, um, and work on this kind of general purpose learning system. So we came up and pioneered with a technique called deep reinforcement learning. And it's sort of combining two techniques together. Deep learning, which is uh, hierarchical neural networks uh, that are used to perceive uh, uh, the world around them. And we combine that with another technique called reinforcement learning, trying to select the right action from the set of available options to you at that moment. And I realized that virtual environments, including games, are a much more efficient way to test out the capabilities of your AI systems than, say, using uh, something like real-world robotics, which are much slower and messier and more expensive to deal with. And you can see why they'd be much more um, efficient, because you can obviously run millions of simulations at once on, in the cloud and train your algorithms on a much more fast iteration. So we, it gives us much quicker feedback as to whether these um, algorithms are working. Another important thing about games is that when you're on a very long-term mission like we are, then it's even more important to know in the short term that you're heading in the right direction. And because games uh, lend themselves very nicely to measuring progress uh, in the terms of scores, um, you can know very quickly if the changes you've made to the AI, AI algorithms are actually um, heading you in the right direction. So we started with um, probably the most iconic of the game consoles, the Atari 2600 from the 80s. So we took 50 classic 8-bit games. So the agents here, all they get as their input are the raw pixels on the screen. And the goal here that we, we set the agent is to maximize the score. 
Everything else is learned completely from scratch, from first principles. So it doesn't have any idea what it's controlling, what gets it points, what the rules of the game are. Um, it, it, it doesn't even have any idea about how video streams work. So the idea that pixels next to each other are correlated in time. It has to find and, and learn about all this structure for itself from first principles by experimenting uh, and experiencing the game, by playing the game. And then we add an additional constraint we want one system to play all the different games out of the box. Some of them very, very different in terms of their objectives and the way they look. So I'll show you this one. I've only got time today to show you one video and um, I'll show you my favorite one, which is from a game called Breakout. So this is after 100 games. So it's, it's not very good yet at playing the game, but it started to get the hang of the idea that it should move this bat towards the ball and that letting the ball go past the bat is probably a bad idea. Now, after 300 games and like another couple hundred games, it's almost um, perfectly mastered the game um, and can kind of play it as well as any human could play this. And it gets the ball back most of the time, even if it's coming back very, at very fast angles. But what would happen if we let the agent play um, for another 200 games? It found that the kind of best strategy was to dig a tunnel around the left-hand side of the wall and send the ball right around the back. And with this kind of incredible efficiency and accuracy, that we researchers who created DQN are absolutely amazing researchers and, and programmers, um, but they're not so good at playing these Atari games themselves. So they didn't know about this strategy and they learned something from their own system. So, um, so that's pretty funny. If you think about the power of general learning systems like this, they can actually master things, complex things that even the programmers uh, don't necessarily know um, how to codify. Thank you.